Who would have thought a former finance minister battling austerity measures in Greece would become a leading voice on the future of technology? It's not exactly the typical career trajectory. Yet here we are. Yanis Varoufakis, the economist who dared to challenge the Troika, the man who stared down the IMF, is now warning us about a different kind of economic behemoth, techno-feudalism. Now, before your eyes glaze over at the word feudalism, stick with me. Forget killer robots and sentient AI taking over the world, Terminator style. Varoufakis's vision is far more insidious, far more subtle, and arguably far more likely. He paints a picture of a future where a handful of tech giants, the new lords, effectively own the very platforms on which we live, work, and play. They control the data. And this is key. Our data, which they then use to predict, manipulate, and ultimately profit from our every move. This isn't some dystopian science fiction novel we're talking about. This is happening right now, under our noses. Think about it. Google? They know what you search for, what piques your curiosity, what keeps you up at night. Amazon? They know what you buy, what tempts you, what you can't resist. And Facebook? Well, they know who you talk to, what you believe, who you are at your core. These companies, through their ubiquitous platforms, are becoming the gatekeepers to information, to commerce, dare I say, even to social interaction itself. They are, in effect, creating their own digital fiefdoms, walled gardens where we, the users, are effectively the product. But here's where things get really interesting, really unsettling. Because unlike traditional feudalism, where serfs at least owned their labor, under techno-feudalism, even that is commodified. We, the users, are no longer just consumers, mindlessly lapping up whatever these platforms are selling. We're unpaid laborers, unwitting cogs in a vast data harvesting machine. Think about it. Every click you make, every like you give, every comment you post, every article you read, every video you watch, it all generates valuable data. And that data, my friends, is the lifeblood of these tech giants. It's what fuels their algorithms, refines their targeting, and ultimately pads their bottom line. And what do we get in return? A personalized ad, a slightly more addictive newsfeed, this imbalance of power, this fundamental asymmetry in the relationship between tech companies and users, is at the very heart of Varoufakis's critique. It's what leads him to make the bold, some might say provocative, claim that we are witnessing the emergence of a new economic order. One where ownership of data trumps traditional capital, where the line between consumer and product becomes blurred beyond recognition. Now, I know what you might be thinking. This all sounds a bit abstract, a bit academic. What does this shift towards techno-feudalism actually mean in practical terms? Well, according to Varoufakis, the implications are vast and far-reaching. First and foremost, it exacerbates inequality on a scale we haven't seen before. Think about it. The wealth generated by all this data extraction isn't trickling down. It's being siphoned upwards, accumulating in the hands of a select few, the tech titans, the venture capitalists, the early investors, while the rest of us are left scrambling for scraps. But it's not just about money. This concentration of power in the digital realm has profound implications for our democracy as well. After all, how free are we really when our digital lives, our access to information, our very thoughts and opinions, are being shaped and molded by entities whose interests don't necessarily align with our own. When the public square has been replaced by a privately owned algorithm, when the very tools we use to connect with one another, to organize, to dissent, are controlled by those who would rather we didn't. And here's the truly insidious part. This erosion of our freedoms, this slow creep towards techno-feudalism, often happens with our tacit consent. We click accept on the terms and conditions without reading them. We hand over our data freely in exchange for convenience, for entertainment, for the illusion of connection. We trade our privacy for the dopamine rush of likes and notifications. And the tech giants, well, they're more than happy to oblige. 
They've perfected the art of the nudge, the subtle manipulation designed to keep us hooked, to keep us scrolling, to keep us generating data. They exploit our fears and insecurities, our hopes and desires, all in the name of profit. And as these platforms become ever more central to our lives, as we work, learn, socialize, even vote online, the stakes only get higher. The potential for manipulation, for control, for outright exploitation grows exponentially. And the very foundations of our society, our privacy, our autonomy, our democracy itself, are put at risk. But before you despair, before you chuck your smartphone in the nearest lake and retreat to a life off the grid, Verifacus wants us to know that all hope is not lost. He's not content to simply be a prophet of doom, warning us of the coming techno-dystopia. No, he also offers a way out, a path to a different future. He calls it techno-socialism. Now, before you roll your eyes or click away, hear me out. Verifacus isn't talking about some kind of Soviet-style command economy for the digital age. He's not suggesting we nationalize Google or turn Mark Zuckerberg into a Communist Party apparatchik. His vision is far more nuanced, far more pragmatic. He argues that data, data, the very lifeblood of this new techno-feudal order, should be treated as a public good. Just like air and water, data is essential for our collective well-being, for a functioning society, for a thriving democracy. And like any public good, it should be owned and governed by the people, not by corporations. Now I know what you might be thinking. Data as a public good? Sounds like a nice idea. But how on earth would that work in practice? Well, Varoufakis proposes a number of concrete steps. For starters, he suggests establishing data trusts, democratically governed entities that manage our collective data for the common good. Think of it like a digital co-op, where users have a say in how their data is used and benefit directly from its monetization. He also advocates for a radical shift in our intellectual property regime. Currently, the algorithms and software that power these platforms are tightly guarded trade secrets. Varoufakis argues that they should be treated as open source commons, freely available for anyone to use, modify, and improve. This would break the stranglehold of the tech giants, fostering innovation and competition in the process. And perhaps most importantly, Varoufakis calls for a fundamental rethink of the relationship between technology and work. He argues that in a world where machines are increasingly capable of performing tasks once done by humans, we need to decouple work from income. One way to do this, he suggests, is through a universal basic income, funded by a tax on the profits of automation. This would provide everyone with a safety net in the face of technological unemployment and free us to pursue more meaningful endeavors. Now I know what you're thinking. Universal basic income, data trusts, open source algorithms, this all sounds very utopian, very pie in the sky. And maybe it is. Maybe Varoufakis is just a dreamer, tilting at windmills in a world hell-bent on techno-feudalism. But here's the thing. Are his warnings really that far-fetched? Look around. The signs are everywhere. From the rise of the gig economy, where workers are treated as disposable cogs, lacking basic rights and protections, to the proliferation of surveillance capitalism, where our every move is tracked, analyzed, and monetized. Think about the last time you used a ride-hailing app, ordered groceries online, or streamed a movie. Every one of those interactions generated data, data that's being used to enrich a handful of powerful corporations while the workers on the ground struggle to make ends meet. And what about the increasing use of facial recognition technology? predictive policing, social credit systems. These technologies, often marketed as tools for safety and efficiency, have the potential to be incredibly oppressive, eroding our privacy and curtailing our freedoms in ways we're only beginning to understand. And it's not just governments we need to worry about. The tech giants themselves are increasingly behaving like nation states, with their own internal laws, their own enforcement mechanisms, and their own agendas. They censor dissenting voices, manipulate algorithms to shape public opinion, 
and lobby governments to protect their interests. In many ways, they already wield more power than many elected officials. And as their reach and influence continue to grow, so too does the threat they pose to our democracy. Now, I'm not saying that technology is inherently bad, far from it. Technology has the potential to be an incredible force for good in the world. It can connect us, educate us, empower us. It can help us solve some of the most pressing challenges facing humanity. But we need to be very careful about who controls this technology and how it's used. So where do we go from here? What can we do as individuals and as a society to avoid sleepwalking into this techno-feudal future? First, we need to wake up to the problem. We need to educate ourselves and others about the dangers of unchecked technological power. We need to start asking hard questions about who controls our data, how it's being used, and who benefits. We need to be more discerning consumers, more conscious users. We need to read the terms and conditions, demand greater transparency from tech companies, and support businesses that align with our values. And yes, we need to be willing to step away from these platforms when necessary, to take a break from social media, to limit our screen time, to rediscover the joys of the offline world. Because the more dependent we become on these technologies, the more power we cede to those who control them. But individual action is only part of the equation. We also need systemic change. We need governments to step up and regulate these tech giants just as they regulate other industries that impact the public interest. This means enacting strong privacy laws, breaking up monopolies, and ensuring that workers in the digital economy have the same rights and protections as those in the traditional economy. It means investing in public alternatives to privately controlled platforms, supporting open source software, and promoting digital literacy. And yes, it might even mean having a serious conversation about things like a universal basic income, a robot tax, or other innovative solutions to the challenges posed by automation and the changing nature of work. Now I know what you're thinking. This all sounds incredibly daunting, like trying to slay a dragon with a toothpick. And you're right. These tech giants are incredibly powerful, incredibly wealthy, and incredibly adept at getting their way. But they're not invincible. No empire lasts forever. And throughout history, time and time again, we've seen that concentrated power, no matter how entrenched, can be challenged and overcome. Think about the labor movement, the suffragettes, the civil rights movement. All of these movements faced seemingly insurmountable odds yet they ultimately succeeded in bringing about profound social change. And we can do the same. We have the power to reclaim our digital lives, to shape a future where technology serves humanity, not the other way around. But it won't be easy. It will require courage, commitment, and collective action on a scale we haven't seen before. And it all starts with a simple question. What kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where a handful of tech overlords control every aspect of our digital lives, where our data is used to manipulate us, exploit us, and control us? Or do we want to live in a world where technology empowers us, where it connects us, educates us, and helps us create a more just and equitable society for all? These are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. These are the stakes of the debate. Because the future is not something that happens to us, it's something we create, but we need to act now. The longer we wait, the harder it will be to turn the tide. The more entrenched these techno-feudal structures will become. The choice is ours. Let's choose wisely. Now, some of you might be listening to this and thinking, Okay, I get it. This techno-feudalism thing, it's a real concern. But what can I, one person, actually do about it? And that's a fair question. 
It's easy to feel powerless in the face of such massive systemic forces. But I want to assure you, your actions, no matter how small they may seem, can make a difference. Here's the thing. These tech giants, they thrive on our apathy. They count on us being too busy, too distracted, too overwhelmed to challenge their power. But the moment we start asking questions, the moment we start demanding better, the moment we start organizing and mobilizing, we become a threat. We chip away at their control, bit by bit. So what can you do? Start by having conversations. Talk to your friends, your family, your colleagues about these issues. Share this video with them. The more people who are aware of the problem, the more likely we are to find solutions. Support organizations that are fighting for digital rights and a more equitable tech ecosystem. There are countless groups out there doing amazing work, from the Electronic Frontier Foundation to Access Now to Free Press. Donate to them. Volunteer for them. Spread the word about their work. And most importantly, don't underestimate the power of your voice. Contact your elected officials and tell them that you care about these issues. Demand that they take action to protect your privacy, to promote competition in the tech industry, and to ensure that technology is used for good. Because here's the reality. Politicians, for all their flaws, they actually do respond to pressure from their constituents. If enough of us make our voices heard, if we make it clear that these issues matter to us, they will have no choice but to listen. And it's not just about contacting your elected officials. Be vocal online as well. Use social media to raise awareness, to share information, to challenge misinformation and propaganda. Hold these tech companies accountable for their actions. Demand that they respect your privacy, that they protect your data, that they use their power for good. Because remember, these platforms, for all their power, they ultimately rely on us. They need our data, they need our attention, they need our participation. Without us, they are nothing. And that, my friends, is where our power lies. We have the power to choose how we use these technologies. We have the power to demand better from the companies that control them. And we have the power to create a future where technology serves humanity, not the other way around. It won't be easy. It will require a sustained effort, a willingness to challenge the status quo, and a belief that a better world is possible. But I truly believe that we can do this. We've overcome seemingly insurmountable challenges before. We've stared down tyranny, fought for equality, and pushed the boundaries of what's possible. And in this digital age, we have a new battle to fight. A battle for the soul of the internet, for the future of our democracy, for the very essence of what it means to be human in the 21st century. And this battle won't be won with swords and shields, but with keyboards and code, with ideas and arguments, with votes and protests. It will be won by ordinary people like you and me who refuse to be pawns in someone else's game. People who understand that technology is not some neutral force, but a tool that can be used for good or evil. It will be won by those who believe in a better future, a future where technology empowers us, connects us, and helps us build a more just and equitable world. A world where we are not serfs on a digital plantation, but citizens of a digital democracy. A world where we are not defined by the data we generate, but by the values we share. A world where technology serves humanity, not the other way around. So I leave you with this. Don't underestimate yourselves. Don't underestimate the power of your voice, your actions, your choices. Because in the end, the future of technology, the future of our society, it's not up to the algorithms. It's not up to the tech giants. 
It's up to us. The future is not something that happens to us. It's something we create. So let's create a future worthy of our humanity. A future where technology serves as a tool for liberation, not oppression. A future where we are all empowered to reach our full potential, both online and off. And if we fail, if we allow techno-feudalism to take root, well then we will have only ourselves to blame. We will deserve to be serfs in this brave new digital world, stripped of our privacy, our autonomy, our very humanity. The choice is ours. The time to act is now. Let's not waste it.